And that's one of the reasons why I left. I mean, I didn't like the fact that they were making profits I'm looking after disabled people. I mean, it was mentally and physically quite difficult. The service users can be pretty demanding. I've had feces thrown at me. I've been punched and kicked. Well, don't get me wrong. There was some fun in the job. I mean, you weren't stacking shelves or out. And sometimes you would get to go cinema. One time, I worked a shift more than 40 hours in a week. Then the next week, they cut it down to 16. And you couldn't say, well, every Thursday night I play football, love. <laughs> it was a zero hours contract. So you like to go bowling, play mini golf. So we did this together for a year. But then with the government cuts, that money stopped. No more bowling for him. It was the poorer families who really got it the hardest. And to the service users, it was a kick in the teeth. It was like it was the government's way of saying, you're not worth anything. But they were worth a lot to me. My life as a support worker. The last part of the four-part well-read film series on work. Thank you very much for coming, Steve. Now, I understand that you were a support worker from 2012 to 2015. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about that job? Yeah, so um, I worked for a small private agency, a family business that was owned by a husband and wife. Parents in our city, they would choose them or another company to spend the money that the government had given them for their child who had learned disabilities. They were aged 19 to 25. It was person-centered care. And the service users there were about 20 when I left. The different aims and objectives, different care plans. I work range from helping at college, the concentration, to day to day things like shopping or getting dressed or helping them brush their teeth. Now, and what does the phrase learning disabled mean? Well, it means your learning is restricted. You need help carrying out daily tasks. It means you won't be able to surpass a certain level. Hmm. At college, for example, they would struggle to read or write and, and would need a lot of assistance with that. So in their daily lives, we were sort of there for everything people just take for granted. Hmm. But mainly we were a bit of respite for their parents. Hmm. Now, was it hard work? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was mentally and physically quite difficult. The service users can be pretty demanding. I've had feces thrown at me. I've been punched and kicked. You know, I've seen people self-harm and it's hard to watch. Doing the best you can, it's really draining. And when you're walking through the city, you're now dealing with members of the public who can be quite triggering for the service users, you know, if they start staring. And there's nothing you can do about it even the more anxious that they get. I remember one, he would jump and flap his arms whenever he was stared at. And this would just begin a vicious cycle. He would be getting more anxious and more people would start staring. But most people, they're okay. It's also stressful because some of the service users, they're dealing with mental health issues as well. Mm. So they could be feeling really upset or really anxious not really be able to communicate how they're feeling. You were sort of like a parent mm. and there was a lot of responsibility attached to it. Yeah. But with how little you got paid, I mean, it was just over minimum wage and it didn't correlate with that amount of responsibility. Mm. Well, don't get me wrong, there was some fun in the job. I mean, you weren't stacking shelves or out. Mm. And sometimes you would get to go cinema. Mm -hmm. But... Sometimes you'll see the same film, you know, maybe a Walt Disney, five times in one week. Because <laughs> if five people all say one after the other, oh, I want to go see that film, can't say, nope, already seen it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how many people worked for the company? Well, I was the first person taken on when I was 20 years old. Hmm. And when I left three years later, there was about 10 workers. Hmm. But I know that they had plans to get much bigger, you know, expand into other cities. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why I left. I mean, I didn't like the fact that they were making profits. I'm looking after disabled people. Mm. And what were the hours and the work shifts like? What, what was your so-called work-life balance? 
Well, when I started, I was on about eight hours a week. Hmm. Well, that changed, and, and when I left, I was more on 50, sometimes 60. And, you know, people that are still working there are still doing these really long hours. And these hours, I mean, they really take their toll. Hmm. They're really long weeks and really long days. And you're not sleeping because you're worrying. Hmm. You're worrying about the service users and you're worrying about the families. I had to rent a flat on my own for 300 pounds a month because I needed to know I could get a good night's sleep so I could do my job properly. And I did, but it's expensive living on your own. <laughs> and cause you're working so much, you can't do much else other than work. Mm. And the shifts, I mean, they were all over the place. Every week the rotor was wrong. They made mistakes. And that's why one of the reasons I'd miss shifts. And each week they'll change the rotor. And it was quite, re quite regular. They'll call you the night before and say, you're working. Sometimes the same morning. You know, I think the managers are incompetent. And that's one of the reasons why I left. So you couldn't plan your life? No, you, no, you couldn't. You could be called in any day of the week. And you couldn't say, well, Every Thursday night I play football, love. It was a zero hours contract. Sometimes the managers would say, you're not working as of yet, but make yourself available on that day, will you? Or they'll call you up and say, we need you in an hour. I can't make any plans. And I did this for three years. One time I worked a shift more than 40 hours in a week. Then the next week they cut it down to 16. So I said, you know, what's happened here then? Did I get a straight answer? No, I didn't. You know, from then on, I started getting treated differently. The dynamics changed. See, I always offered to work more. I wanted to show I was willing. But looking back, I think it was a mistake. Because as soon as you say no, you're a piece of shit. And you're not really living a life. It was tough. And like I says, because you're on minimum wage, you don't have nothing to show for it at the end of the week. Now, how did the company treat their support workers? Well, it was okay at first. And the company, I mean, they did put me through a lot of training. Mm. So they did do good in that respect. Initially, I felt valued. But after a while, it became not so nice and I was tired and then my birth mother died and I was missing shifts. I wasn't working as much as I could have been or should have been and I got called in. My manager's, you know, he, he said he was sympathetic. He said, Steve, take a couple of days off. We'll pay you in bereavement. <laughs> but that didn't happen though. I'm still waiting on that check. And at this point, there were still not many workers. So I was still doing lots and lots of work, still doing loads of hours. But you feel obliged, not to the management, but you feel obliged to the families who need some respite. Once, I did say though, you know, after I worked more than 40 hours in a week, look, no, I can't do it. I can't do any extra shifts. They sent out a text to everybody. It said, Thanks for everyone for being flexible and highlighted everyone who had been flexible. They were trying to make an example and they often did, you know, underhand things like that. The company, they should have just hired more workers. They went through cycles where they would literally rely on the same one or two people to do all these extra shifts. And I know, because it happened to me. I was the first one. Now, I understand that you sometimes were required to spend nights with service users in the company's respite home. What were conditions like then? It weren't too bad. You know, I weren't asked you to see on Panorama, right? It was clean. We did the cleaning. Furniture was all right. Bed was comfortable. Food was okay. I mean, we did the cooking. We just got takeaways. But the toilet at the respite house 
well that didn't work very well at all so we called the company asked them to send out a plumber they wouldn't they said just use a coke bottle that lasted for three months after a while the company they were more concerned about the profits than the were the people in the beginning they said that they wouldn't be like other agencies but after a while it was just bullshit now there have been a great number of cuts uh, made by the government against disabled people in recent years uh, you must have witnessed the impact of such cuts on the daily lives of the people that you were working with yeah i did there was um one man he was age 19 who we looked after for about five months he's from a deprived part of town didn't get out much he was an hour away from the city and his family they didn't have much money anyway so he was isolated he had severe learning difficulties couldn't talk so this is an individual who's who's vulnerable and needs a lot of support but with the money that he had he could literally only afford eight hours of our support and it wasn't enough. But then one day the budget was just cut and it was abrupt. And I never seen him or his family ever again. They just couldn't afford us anymore. Do you have any other examples? There was another man. He was aged 23. And he just discovered he was autistic. Before that, they just thought he was a bad kid. Unlike some, he had money so he could pay for his activities. So he liked to go bowling, play mini golf. So we did this together for a year. But then with the government cuts, that money stopped. No more bowling for him. And he didn't have much money in the first place anyway. You know, it was the poorer families who really got it the hardest. And to the service users, it was a kick in the teeth. It was like it was the government's way of saying, you're not worth anything. But they were worth a lot to me. Personally, you know, they brought me a lot of joy and, and I really enjoyed working with them. So what did you like best about the job, Steve? What, what satisfaction did you get? Well, like I said, you know, I really liked working with them and, and I miss them. And I really enjoyed working with the families and, and seeing how effective our work was for the families. It's an hard life bringing up a child who's learning disabled. We was working with service users what were in transition, which basically means they've just left school and, and they've not got much else to do. So this gets parents really anxious. You know, what's next for my child? And they get worried. See, it's an hard life when your child is presenting behaviours which are so oppositional. So I really felt like I was helping them out. And why did you get into this line of work in the first place? Well, I wanted to do something more socially valuable. I wanted to work with people. It's better than working in a shop lining people's pockets. Before, I worked in, in a, a clothing shop and I kind of thought it was worthless work, in my opinion. But after a while, I started dreading going to the agency and, and facing the managers, so... I just went college instead. Well, good luck with your college course and thank you very much for being interviewed. You're welcome.